All right, excellent. So it is my distinct honor and pleasure uh, to welcome Dr. Joseph uh, Romano to talk to us today. Uh, the title of his talk is up there. So currently, uh, Joseph is a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he got his undergraduate degree in molecular genetics from the University of Vermont with uh, Neil Sarkar, who's a name that many of us know, uh, and then um, uh, to Columbia for his graduate training with his uh, master's and Phil and PhD in computational toxicology in 2019, and is now uh, yep, a postdoc at um, University of Pennsylvania in the lab of uh, Jason Moore and Trevor Penning. So he is a fantastic stories to tell chalk talks tomorrow um this looks really really interesting so i hope everybody enjoys it joseph uh, over to you great thank you very much thanks for the very kind introduction um yeah I'm, I'm thrilled to be talking about this today um for those of you who who know jason he's actually at cedar sinai now but he's sort of mentoring me from from abroad at this point um it's been great working with him though and i know that he has some connections with your department so i'm sure some of you are familiar with him um, but yeah, so the title of my talk is AI for Knowledge Driven, Driven Discovery in Computational Toxicology. Um, this is really interesting space right now. Computational toxicology is waking up to the, you know, I don't know, I don't want to call it necessarily the AI revolution because that sounds a little buzzwordy, but um, I think everybody here can appreciate the power that artificial intelligence has for biomedical research. And so we'll be talking about some applications in computational toxicology today. I don't really need to spend much time on this um, because Dr. Brooks was very kind enough to pre present this information already. Um, but, but yeah, my background is in molecular genetics and biomedical informatics. Um, I do a lot of work in AI right now. Uh, my work is primarily applied, but I also do methodological and algorithmic research as well. Uh, kind of split my time between both. And um, yeah, so let's jump right in. So toxicology, I think you're probably familiar at least somewhat with the term. Um, my simplified definition of what toxicology is, is that it's the study of the adverse effects of chemicals on living organisms and also on the environment. Uh, and there's different types of toxicology out there, or different branches of it based on the area of application. So environmental toxicology focuses on environmental exposures to chemicals. Uh, occupational toxicology focuses on those types of um, exposures that occur in the workplace. Uh, and then there's also toxicology that could be focused on the effects of pharmaceutical compounds that you would occur during uh, medical scenarios. Uh, and predictive toxicology in particular is when we use computational and statistical techniques to predict, hopefully previously unobserved or often previously unobserved, toxic effects of specific chemicals. Uh, and I like to focus particularly on the human body. I know that, you know, a lot of research is done using model organisms, but the ultimate goal for me is to translate the research that we're doing into human health. Uh, and the different areas of toxicology that are listed on this page, it's worth mentioning that oftentimes they occur simultaneously and in mixtures with each other. So I've talked about AI a little bit, but what is the role of AI when it comes to toxicology? And this is my opinion. Um, that AI should help experimental toxicologists by A, predicting new associations between specific chemicals and endpoints of toxicity. So other, in other words, the different diseases that might result from being exposed to a chemical. And B, explaining the mechanisms that might underlie those predictions. Uh, and this is a key point that I like to especially point out when I'm talking to, to basic scientists and experimental toxicologists is that we're not proposing that AI should replace experimental validation. That's still a critical component of the process. Rather, AI should be helping us to focus our time and effort on the questions that are most likely to bear fruitful results. So the work that I'm going to be talking about today is related to this K99R00 award I was recently awarded by the National Library of Medicine. Um, so, so yeah, th this is something that I'm currently working on and have uh, at least three and a half years more of support from, but I expect to continue this work later down into my career as well. So here's an outline of the work that I'm gonna to present today. First, I'm gonna talk about this thing called CompTOX AI, which is a knowledge base and computational data infrastructure for computational toxicology work. I'll then talk about different information retrieval and synthesis problems and applications we're doing with CompTOX AI. 
I'll talk about how we're using graph machine learning to predict new endpoints of toxicity, and then I'll talk about our future plans for this work. Okay, so what is CompTOX AI, this thing that I'm talking about? Basically, like I said, it's a computational data infrastructure to support AI-based research in computational toxicology. And the way it works is it's primary, primarily centered around a large graph database that's implemented in Neo4j that represents different entities that are pertinent to computational toxicology research. So obviously chemicals, but then things like diseases, body systems, um, genes, proteins, different interactions, metabolic pathways, and other things that might come into play as well. And this graph knowledge base is built by aggregating data from a number of external public databases. I think we have about 18 different databases included in this so far, uh, and incorporating them together and controlling them in the context of a large manually constructed ontology. And basically what we do is we let the data from these external public databases fill in or instantiate the classes within this ontology and then use various connecting tools to populate our graph database using that ontology. We then present this graph database alongside a number of different website and data browsing tools, programmatic access tools, including a web API and a Python package, and then a gallery of machine learning models that can make it so we can do prediction with this. This is all available at comptox.ai um, in a relatively preliminary form. We're publishing some of the first papers on this. Um, and there a number of tools are already available, but this is going to be an ongoing and evolving work that will continue to grow over the next couple of years. Okay, so I mentioned that um, it's a knowledge base. So what is the difference between data and knowledge? This is a really crucial component of the work that we do. Uh, data is raw observations. Uh, and these are usually, or at least often quantitative, or they can be interpreted in a quantitative context. Uh, and an example of data would be specific gene expression measurements, usually things produced as the result of a single experimental observation. Knowledge, on the other hand, is a meaningful understanding of pheno phenomena, in this case, biological phenomena. And knowledge often results from the analysis of many points of data, often performed, often gained through many different experiments run um, over a, a long amount of time. And they typically leverage some sort of idealized view of the world around you. So an example of knowledge would be that a specific chemical X upregulates expression of a gene Y. That's an example. And so CompTOX AI focuses on the knowledge that we've gained through analyzing many different pieces of data. This image here is just of the home page of CompTOX AI. It's sort of the landing page. You can see there in the center of the screen is a, it's basically an ontological hierarchy showing the different types of major entities that are represented in the database along with some counts and the types of relationships that we define between the different types of entities in the knowledge base. So people can go and browse that website if they'd like to. This is a snapshot and you're, you're not really supposed to be able to read the text that's on these nodes, but just to show you um, what the graph knowledge base looks like, the graph database that's contained inside this. Um, and the way that it works, as opposed to relational databases where data are presented in tables with different implied relationships between the tables, uh, the information in a graph database is presented as nodes representing entities and then edges connecting those nodes to one another, showing what the real world relationships are between those entities. Uh, and as you can see, this can represent really complex and dense data structures. This is just a very small component related to a specific adverse outcome pathway within our graph knowledge base. Um, but you can see the types of really complex relationships that start to become apparent when you query the knowledge base for various things. And by leveraging this network structure in our analyses, we can come up with really complicated and really powerful analyses and results coming from them. So here's a count of the major entity types that are re represented in CompTOX AI. You can see that obviously the most prevalent thing in here is a chemical. So we have 780,000 unique chemicals. Uh, we have 62,000 genes going down the list. You can see that we include other things like pathways, um, not listed on here as diseases, but those are also recently added to the knowledge base. Um, and I like to point out that some of these classes of things that we include, like chemical lists and adverse outcome pathways, help us cope with the fact that there's just a massive amount of chemicals in here and a massive amount of chemicals we need to wrangle. 
these two particular classes help us to group our chemicals into essentially functional or otherwise related groups of chemicals that may be related to one another, which allows us to better tackle this massive search space of chemicals when we're making more targeted analyses. So to make this usable, we provide a number of different data interfaces along with CompTOX AI. These are all available and freely, freely accessible by anyone who wants to use them. So we have a graphical data browser and data set generator tools on the website. So you can, those are especially designed for people with limited computational expertise. And those make it easier to access data and knowledge within the knowledge base. We also provide direct access to a graph database, either local or remote, so people can download the, the database and install it on their own computer, or they can use our public version that we make available on the internet. Uh, we also provide, like I said, a web API, so you can gain programmatic access to the data by requesting the endpoints of this web API. And then we also have a Python package, which provides, again, access to the data just through a different format. Um, and allows you to easily construct various machine learning models using the Python programming language. So uh, we also include alongside all of this documentation to teach people how to use it and examples of it. Here's an image of that data portal that I mentioned, sort of the simplified interface. So in this case, um, say you wanted to search for the gene CYP2E1. Um, it's one that has various applications in toxicology, so that might be an, a use case that people would have. Uh, we see that it identified the node in the knowledge base, it pulled up some information about it, um, and it's, there's various options for sending it to other analysis tools and analysis modules that are provided alongside that allow people to do more advanced analyses with it. This is the, um, the help page for the API. It's an interactive way to look at the different um, endpoints that the API provides, as well as allowing you to construct your queries of it here if you're not totally familiar with the command line interface for doing so. Uh, this does conform to the open API standard, so the idea is that this should, in the future, be interoperable with other biomedical data resources external to CompTOX AI, so that's a long-term goal that we have. And everything as part of CompTOX AI is fully available for free and it's all open access and open source. So everything's available on GitHub. Um, you can browse it, the code there, you can download the code library, look at the different pieces of, um, of documentation or even contribute to it if you, if you would like to contribute to CompTOX AI yourself, either via the code or the data or providing bug requests, et cetera. All right, now that I've given you a little tour of CompTOX AI, I'll talk about some of the information retrieval and information synthesis tasks you might be able to perform using it, using a couple particular examples. So in doing so, I think it's good to acknowledge that there's a couple different paradigms for discovery that we focus on using CompTOX AI. Uh, the first would be directly inferring information and relationships by looking at the contents of the network defined in this graph knowledge base. So by stitching together chains of relationships that are originally fragmented across multiple original data sources, we're able to come up with new relationships that are otherwise unapparent. Uh, we can also inspect higher order network architecture and do various like graph analysis and network analysis type stuff to learn new things about the toxicology space. Uh, the other way that we can do discovery is to predict new unobserved relationships that are never represented in any of the source databases using machine learning, and we'll get to an example of that later on. Okay, so in order to do this, we designed a number of easy-to-use information retrieval tools, and we've given names to each of them that correspond to the names you see here on the page. But the first one that we'll look at is the shortest path module, which identifies the most direct mechanistic routes that would link two or more entities within the graph. The second one is something we call the expand network tool. And this shows an entity in the graph knowledge base in the context of its nearby neighbors, which tells you how it might function in a living system. The third one is this thing that we call the QSAR dataset generator. And this is something that dynamically builds tabular data sets that you can then use to predict specific toxic endpoints using molecular fingerprints for a list of chemicals. And we'll go through an example that shows that later on as well. So looking at the shortest path module, um, we, we picked a particular use case. And this is one that's rooted in an open-ended question in toxicology that a lot of people are interested in exploring right now. And that's the connection between this chemical perfluorooctanoic acid which is an industrially used chemical that's 
um, really of, of pretty intense interest in the toxicology community right now. Uh, if anyone's seen the movie a couple years back called Dark Waters, stars Mark Ruffalo, a very good movie, talked about sort of the discovery of this chemical PFOA being used and the different types of adverse outcomes that come out of it. It causes all sorts of crazy health outcomes. One of the ones that only recently has been talked about and has only been explored on a very surface level as far as the mechanistic reasoning behind it is an association with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is a very important disease to be studying in the, in the context of toxicology. We just don't know exactly how it works. Um, but by looking at Comptox AI, we can get it to tell us these are the genes that PFOA modulates expression of, which then may therefore may be related to the etiology of that disease. And if you look at this, you'll see that there's a number being upregulated, a number being downregulated. Some of them are talked about in the current literature with respect to both PFOA and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But two in particular, the ones that I show here in red, NFE2L2 and CD14, these are never mentioned simultaneously in the scientific literature with both PFOA and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So the graph knowledge base approach has allowed us to stitch these things together and show us that this is something that could be actionable. In talks with various um, toxicologists who, um, who work with the, the biology of PFOA and with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, they think that both of these are biologically plausible. So we're actually going to be exploring these experimentally to make sure that the, the things that are being spit out by CompTOX AI are actually real validatable um, endpoints and, and mechanistic support. Here's the second example. This one shows the expand network module that I briefly mentioned. In this case, we queried using another different, uh, another different chemical that's of pretty in incredible use um, industrially, and this is called dioxin. Dioxin is a chemical that's extremely toxic. It's been associated with a number of environmental disasters that have led to great loss of human life in the past. So it's of, of high interest. The, the, um, the EPA actually lists this as one of the 100 chemicals of highest toxicologic concern. Um, and so what we did is we just said, let Comtox AI tell us about the local network context of dioxin. And so you see what it does here when we tell it to do so is it spits out this graph that sort of naturally organizes into these four different modules or communities. And if we look at it, they, these tend to represent um, over here in, in A, we see that it's things involve modulating um, different aryl hydrocarbon receptor activity, which could be leading to various types of, um, of reproductive um, abnormalities and reproductive decline. Uh, in B here, we see sort of these interesting associations to um, kidney disease, it seems like, um, and impaired fertility. And then in both C and D, we see different types of cancers being highlighted. So we see that there's actually real mechanistic stuff being returned by this tool. Um, but some of the things that might be more, most interesting to look at are some of the nodes that bridge these communities. For example, here we see NFE2L2. This is the same thing that showed up in the previous um, example that I gave using PFOA, it's the same gene, uh, that seems to bridge the connection between community A and community B in this diagram. So that might be a really important thing to look at if we want to understand the context of dioxin and how it interacts with us as a biological system. We also see that in red here are other chemicals that are different from dioxin that also tend to co-associate with some of these other conditions. So that could be a really interesting way to start aggregating groups of chemicals that have similar adverse outcomes. Uh, so a lot of different things could emerge out of the work that would be suggested by something like this. Okay, so now that I've given you a couple of examples of information retrieval and information synthesis, I'm gonna dive into using graph machine learning, which might be the more interest to the people who are on this call. Uh, and this would be for predicting, predicting specific endpoints of toxicity using the knowledge that's in CompTOX AI. Um, I'll mention that this is uh, based on the work that was recently presented at the Pacific Symposium for Biocomputing. Some of you may have been present for that. I know that uh, Dr. Larry Hunter, who's um, a, a close collaborator with many of you and a member of the, of the center. Um, he, was, he was there for, for that talk, so he got to hear this. Um, but what we're basically doing is we are taking something which is an old technique that's been used by toxicologists for decades called QSAR, and we're showing that we can improve upon it in the context of predictive toxicology using semantic graph data provided by CompTOX AI 
and this graph machine learning approach. So what is QSAR, this thing that I mentioned in the last slide? QSAR stands for Quantitative Structure Activity Relationships, and it's a modeling technique where you use the structure of chemicals, so quantitative representations of chemical structure, and then you build a predictive model with the endpoint being some sort of activity. In this case, it's toxicity. And the types of, of structural characteristics that can be fed in as inputs to this model could either be these binary fingerprints representing characteristics of the structure, or they can be more continuous descriptors, things like molecular weight, log p value, the number of aromatic rings. Um, we use molecular fingerprints because they're particularly good for constructing um, these predictive models we have found. And notice that this model can be really anything that you want. It could be a logistic regression model. It could be a, a deep learning network. It could be random forest. It could be anything that you want. One of the things to note though, is that QSAR has kind of underperformed, even though it's something that's very common for people in toxicology to use as a standard part of their research toolkit, um, it, it tends to perform pretty poorly uh, on most tasks. And so that's really our impetus for going into exploring whether uh, this graph machine learning approach might improve upon traditional approaches. And so in doing graph machine learning, we touch on this idea of artificial neural networks. Um, many of you are probably familiar with these, at least to some level, but I'll give a brief overview. Um, artificial neural networks are essentially artificial representations of a biological neural network. Um, and there are these models that consist of nodes, so those would be these circles on the screen, organized into layers. So you see that there's multiple layers represented here, which are usually stacked one on top of each other. And by stacking these different transformations represented as the layers of nodes, you end up with the ability to construct really complex relationships between the input features going into a model and then the outputs that are being predicted out of it. So um, deep learning is something that has emerged out of artificial neural network research. Basically what deep learning is, is it's neural networks that have tens or hundreds of layers of depth. Now we're using a particular type of artificial neural network in this research called a graph neural network. And graph neural networks, obviously we're using it because we're working with graph data. Um, but the way that they work is, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an intuitive walkthrough. So say we wanted to predict some sort of outcome on this disease node here in this theoretical made up graph that I've presented on the screen. The way it works is the first layer of the network looks at the immediately adjacent neighbors in the network. In this case, it's these two pathway nodes. The next layer of the artificial neural network would look at their neighbors and then so on and so forth for however many layers you have in the neural network. And so what it's doing is it's using the information contained in the locally surrounding network context to influence what the decision is being made on this disease in this case. And it's using that information to make the prediction. Notice that it's both pulling the information that could be attached to these nodes as metadata and also be pulling the information contained in the network structure of the relationships themselves. So it's drawing from both things simultaneously. <clears throat> okay, so how did we apply this in the context of Comtox AI? <clears throat> well, what we did here is we pulled out basically a subgraph from our knowledge base that corresponds to the types of entities that are really pertinent in this QSAR analysis. And that would be in this case, chemicals, genes, which we thought would give some interesting pathway context to the chemicals, and then specific toxicological assays that are also represented in there. So the task that we're trying to predict is whether a chemical has an active assay for it or whether the chemical does not activate that assay. Notice that we have about eight and a half thousand chemicals. That's because the data source that we're using for the assays, which is the TOX21 data set, only has good annotated information for about eight and a half thousand chemicals. So that's what we use to test it. <clears throat> so here's an overview of how we actually structured this analysis. So like I said, we have CompTOX AI over here on the left-hand side, information being pulled in from graph data, from public databases being incorporated into a graph database which we then extract this heterogeneous graph representing chemicals, genes, and assays, which is influenced by the TOX21 data set of assays. We also pull out the quantitative node features from that graph database corresponding to the structure of the chemicals and then whatever other features we want to include from genes and assays in the model as well. 
We then apply these in the context of a convolutional graph neural network, which does what we call edge type dependent aggregation and interprets the graph connectivity in the context of the graph convolutional neural network and train it individually on each of those 52 predictive tasks where each of those is a separate toxicological assay. And we evaluate those predictive models for performance. Okay, so how does it perform? Well, it turns out that it performs pretty well. Um, in this image, we show two sort of representative um, assays from the collection of 52 we applied this to. Uh, the blue and green lines are the two sort of gold standard QSAR models, one being a random forest model and the other being gradient boosting model. Neither of those use the graph to do it. Um, the graph neural network, however, on the other hand, is the red model. And you can see that in both cases here, it significantly outperformed both the random forest and the gradient boosting classifier models. Um, and it does this across the board for all 52 of the assays. Um, so what we see here is that the graph neural network is really significantly outperforming the current gold standard that we trained very rigorously using a high performance computing cluster and grid search on all the metaparameters. So we think that we're giving it the best possible um, opponent to go up against. The next natural question, and one that comes up when we're constructing AI systems in general, is why did these graph neural networks perform so much better? And so the way that we explored this is by conducting what we call an ablation analysis. And an ablation analysis is something often used in the evaluation of AI systems, where you take a system and you pull apart, you take different components out of that system and see how does it impact the performance of it. So what we see here is we see that Again, we have in red the full model. So in other words, the, the, basically the baseline that we're working with, the graph neural network. If we take away either the chemical structure, which is normally the only thing being used to make these predictions, or we take away the gene information from that subgraph, we see that there's only a marginal decrease in performance. And again, this is something that's replicated pretty much across the board. However, if we pull away the other assays, the ones that are not related to the one that we're currently trying to predict, we see that the performance drops off to just barely better than random performance. So just above the diagonal line here on the ROC plot. Um, and so what does that mean? That means that basically the way that these graph neural networks are obtaining most of their predictive power is by looking at the information contained in other unrelated assays and using that to infer what is the activity going to be in this new assay that we're trying to predict. So that tells us that we could be capitalizing on on all sorts of public data. Sorry, are we, are we still online here? I just, there was a power flash. Yep, you're still here. Okay, you. Th thanks so much, sorry. Uh, there was a power flash. There's, there's actually thunderstorms going on right now. So I apologize if that happens again. Um, I don't think you need to apologize for the weather, mate. You're good to go. <laughs> 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 it's a good oh. excuse to get out of it, just turn the computer off. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> but, but anyways, jumping back into the talk here. Um, uh, so, so yeah, we, we see that basically what we can do is use public screening data to compensate for the fact that these QSAR models likely underperform using the, tra the traditional approaches. So we consider that a really significant advantage. Um, another thing I want to point out here is that this performance that we're getting is pretty good on tasks that toxicologists usually find to be extremely challenging. Um, in this case, uh, th this one that I show here on the right-hand side of the screen, that's cell viability. And cell viability is notoriously challenging to predict. So if you expose a cell, a human cell or a, a mouse cell or something else to a particular chemical, it's very challenging to predict whether that will result in loss of viability or not in many cases. Uh, the one that we showed on the left-hand side, pregnane X receptor agonism, is another really interesting toxicological assay that sort of acts as a general, um, a general indicator of whether something will be toxic in the context of, of your liver, so hepatotoxicity. So these are two things. And another reason why we picked them is because um, there isn't another direct analog to either of those these assays in the collection of the 52 assays that we have. So we can be pretty sure that there isn't some sort of information leakage happening with some other extremely highly correlated assay that's included in the knowledge graph. Okay, so that's an overview, like I said, of the graph machine learning. Um, 
we're getting, we're, we're doing pretty well on time here. So um, I just want to stop and see, does anybody have any questions that have come up so far based on the things that I've discussed? I have a couple of sort of more foundational things that yes. I would find useful for um, helping, helping me understand a bit better. Absolutely. The, um, I think it was in your expanded neural, uh, your expanded network IR tools, you had um, about, it was nearest neighbor matching and there was another kind of match, expand network and shortest path. Yeah, so how or who performs all of the uh, clinical validation and biological validation? Because, you know, those aren't always the same thing. Just because something is biologically plausible doesn't mean it's clinically relevant. Yeah, so so that, that, that's a great question and one that, um, I can honestly say we have not fully evaluated yet because of how new we are into this process and how early are on we are. What we're basically going by is we're we're using a bunch of source databases that we consider to be kind of the gold standard in their field. So if we look at, for example, a link between um, between a gene associating a gene and a disease and some association being there, um, we're using really highly curated data to represent that. Um, and like I said, we're, we're going with sort of more of a knowledge-based approach. So uh, rather than having results of a bunch of different raw experiments, we're going with essentially other knowledge bases that have already performed this curation. Um, and, and this creeps into the knowledge graph in a bunch of different ways, right? Because we're incorporating this from, let's say 18, I, I believe it's 18 different databases as the source. So we're being very cautious when we go about this. We're not using anything where we have some sort of ambiguity with thresholding values, you know, lack of certainty. Um, but we are also representing these relationships along with whatever evidence comes along with it. So for example, um, if you download the full version of our graph knowledge base, you can go in and you can see what the PubMed IDs are for a particular annotation that is represented in there. Uh, you can also see the uh, kind of the data provenance, the, the the, the paper trail of where we source that information. So if you're ever getting a recommendation from CompTOX AI, it's always possible to go back to the source and interpret it. Because yeah, there is no real substitute for manually going back and validating the thing that's coming out. Um, we all know that data being processed strictly through, um, through uh, automatic means has various types of quality concerns. And you know we're not here to solve that, but we are here yeah. to present you with the tools you need to, to get the full picture of the data. Did that, did that answer your question? I did. That, that's fantastic. So then that just leads to one more thing that was kind of on my mind as well. Sure. Like yeah. the, you know, I'm thinking in terms of, and again, we talked about this when we chatted a, an hour ago that, you know, my experience doing this is with fruit flies. It was nearly 20 years ago and it was a different world, right? But that you get all kinds of data back when you're doing some of these experiments and it's, yeah. The caveat was always, you know, like you'll sometimes you'll see really strong associations like this huge upregulation of transcription that looks exciting and it's completely spurious. It just happens to be a really heavily one sided reaction. Yeah. Right. Whereas you might see something that's a much slower burn that causes in, in this my world will be a long term developmental effect as opposed to a short acting blast of damaging um, toxicology, for example. So yeah, is there yeah. any temporality associated with these um, experiments or is it is it more of a sort of a linear, you will give you some data, then go fish and you have to tease out what's going on? So my answer to that is stay tuned. This is one of the things we're Brilliant. looking at. And it's one of the topics of basically one of the next papers that's supposed to come out of this is the temporal aspect of this. Cool. Um, and that that's something that arose naturally as part of the discussions that we've had with with actual both clinical toxicologists and then experimental toxicologists. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're looking at a couple different use cases that we really want to be able to tackle using this. Um, two in particular are the, the cases of diseases related to inhalation toxicology. And, the, and the, the second one is reproductive toxicology. So a lot of the things that come out of, especially these perfluoroalkyl compounds, um, which it, it's a really, like I said, high area of interest in as far as the funding agencies are concerned, and also it's just very biologically interesting, um, is we, it's been observed that mothers can be observed to these, and then their children are actually the ones that show the clinical downstream effects. So the diseases may actually not be cropping up in the people who are exposed to the chemicals, but rather their offspring. And so that comes up, you know, a whole lot of questions about what's happening as far as reproductive development, 
Yeah. Uh, and how can we represent that in the knowledge base? So we're looking into strategies for representing it. We don't have it yet. It's on our roadmap. Um, another couple of things to mention that are also going to be coming out of this soon, but we don't currently have fully worked in, is the, dif the, the distinction between genes and the different protein isoforms that may arise from the, those, disease, those genes. Because just saying that something upregulates expression of a gene doesn't fully capture the structural yeah, yeah. implications of that. That's a huge thing. And then also genetic variation. So polymorphisms and, and other types of genetic variations that may contribute. Because another big area of interest in computational toxicology is looking at how, does, how do genetic variants contribute to susceptibility to toxic outcomes. Mm -hmm. So these are all things that we're going to be working on soon. Um, again, this, this grant only started in September. So we've been working on it a relatively short amount of time in the entire scope of what we plan to work on, but there's a lot of things that we've, we've, we've got started on. Wonderful, a lot of really interesting questions. Thanks. No, thank you. Can I ask a quick question? Because I think I'm, yes. this is disease prediction, is in predicting a disease in someone who doesn't have it, not classification, correct? Um, it's, it is basically classification. So what we're trying to do, the, the task that we're trying to accomplish sort of from the highest level is we want to know, we have this chemical, we don't know what it does to the human body because we haven't had the ability to perform a rigorous risk assessment analysis on it. Like I said, there's 780,000 chemicals in, in our knowledge base, and we only know what diseases could be caused by a small handful of them. It's our goal to use computational techniques to suggest what those diseases might be for things that we haven't categorized. They may be very rare outcomes, so we just don't see it on surveillance, or it could be that we have never conducted the research or, or even just looked at them in the first place to understand what that might be. So it's not, it's not really predicting in the context of an individual patient, rather than it is understanding the capability of these chemicals in the context of human disease. Okay. Yeah. And the reason I'm asking is that, you know, when you report an AUC of like 0.94, you know, there's this kind of thought, the only two things that are certain in life, or that certain in life are death and taxes, right? Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, it comes up a lot when we, you know, when people present predictive models for disease, right. that nothing is that predictive. And so it makes you, which I think you kind of alluded to, are you just classically, is this a reverse causality, you know, association, or are you, you know, obviously classification, you can reach that level, you know, because a picture is, you know, if you're class, you know, something can be in a category, yeah. or not. but, um, but I, you know, I was wondering, in fact, I've, I've, I haven't heard this framed formally, but I've wondered if there should be some kind of, um, well, the two thoughts, one is obviously putting uh, some kind of error distribution on the prediction as opposed to just point estimates, which is, you know, its own kind of thing. But then, you know, is there an upper limit to an AUC where you say, you know what, this is too high. We're not actually predicting. We're actually, we're probably, I get it. There's something else that is, you know, like you said, sort of correlated with the outcome yeah. and we're just, you know, we're finding that. So, so, so yeah, I think that um, one of the things that will help with this is if I just go back and clarify a little bit about the specific predictive task that we're making here. Um, and and so what you're suggesting is that it would be very, very hard to attain anything of such a high predictive accuracy if the, if the endpoint that we were predicting was truly clinical. Um, if this was, if, if either of these corresponded to a specific disease in a patient population, yeah, I would be extremely suspect of those AUCs. The predictive tasks that we're performing in this case are tied to specific in, vi in vitro chemical assays. So these are things that we can be relatively confident in that um, a chemical can, will in a reproducible fashion, be able to activate an assay um, in an in vitro context for a specific cell line. So if you looked at these assays in the TOX21 data set, they very well document, you know, what is the cell line that this is being done in and what are the experimental protocols. So for, for that, from that perspective, I think that we can be relatively confident in these AUCs. We, we, we're not seeing something that's really inconsistent with the experimental framework that these assays were designed in. Um, but, but yeah, if we were trying to produce some sort of level of confidence in how something would cause a disease uh, in a clinical or a population setting, absolutely. There's a huge amount of uncertainty there. 
Um, and I think that's the reason why we started with the assays rather than the actual disease endpoints as the first predictive task, because we know that this is reproducible. And then we want to reach out to the, the higher hanging fruits, the ones that are more interesting, but more complex. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 no, that's great. Great, awesome. But yeah, again, um, this is a very translationally focused research effort. So even though a lot of what I've been presenting here has been um, very biological, uh, we definitely want to bring this to the clinical aspect. And um, um, I'll talk a little bit about the future steps that we have for this, um, and that might make a little bit more of that clear. But before I do that, are there any other questions before I get on to the, the final steps of this, um, of, this, of this slideshow here? Yeah, can I ask a question about that graph you were just on, or those graphs you were just on? Yes, this one or, or this one? That one, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, I know that, um, uh, no, the one, the other one. Um, this one. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I know that neural nets are uh, famous or infamous for being black boxes, but right. do you know, or do you have any insights as to why the uh, chemical assay, the, the information on the other chemical assays is contributing so much to the performance? So, yeah, good question. There's actually kind of two parts of that that I want to address. The first is actually this notion of, you know, black box neural networks. Um, I think that what we have here is a really tremendous opportunity presented by the fact that this entire graph knowledge base is controlled using a semantically meaningful underlying structure. So yeah, if you feed something into a neural network, it seems like a black box, but when you're directly attached to a meaningful underlying structure where the nodes in, the, in this network correspond to entities and the relationships between them have semantic meaning that are human understandable, all you have to do is look at which are the, which are the highest weighted neurons in the network and what is the meaningful human understandable entity that it's attached to? So it has sort of built-in interpretability. We can look at this and say exactly which other assays are contributing most to the predictive performance of any one of the things that we're trying to predict. So that, that's the first part of it. Um, and then the second part is you're asking why, is the, why are the other assays contributing so much information as opposed to the other things that are in the network? Uh, and there, there, there isn't a... I can't be 100% certain about this, but I have a few uh, well-informed um, uh, sort of guesses as to what's going on. Uh, the first is that trying to predict activity just based on structure is really hard. It turns out that having this one dimension, these one-dimensional measures of structure, which is, like I said, traditionally the only thing that QSAR is being performed on, it's, it's really hard to get a good prediction from that. It leaves so much out of what's going on with the way that the chemicals interact with the human body. It doesn't tell you anything about the biological context, and it doesn't even capture a lot of the higher level um, interactions that might even be going on within the molecule. You know, if, imagine you're using a peptide, it's the, uh, the, the tertiary and quaternary effects that are conveying a lot of the biological activity. Um, meanwhile, the assays in this are good surrogates for actual biological processes that are going on. Uh, because they're tied to specific biochemical processes. Like, for example, pregnane X receptor, that is something that could be bound by one of these chemicals. And so being able to understand that something is binding to the pregnane X receptor might be extremely influential in terms of one of the other assays that we would like to predict, because there are similarities and differences between different assays. And when we have 52 of them, that might give us a good profile to, to, to use to make these predictions. Uh, the third thing that I want to mention just very briefly is that um, this was a kind of quick and dirty model that we made. So there could be some tuning that we can do, especially with regularization and other things that leverage different parts of these graph neural networks that could make it more effectively utilize the other components. And that may just be something that we have to see in time. But those are my thoughts. Thanks. Sure. So yeah, um, let, let's, like I said, briefly talk about what some of the future steps are. And some of these I just touched on just a second ago when I was, when I was answering that question. Um, uh, some of the things that we want to do, particularly pertaining to graph machine learning, 
uh, we want to see what happens if we incorporate other types of entities into the subgraphs that we're constructing here. So instead of just having the chemicals, the, the genes, and the assays, we want to add diseases, you know, to get to the clinical aspect. We want to add pathways to give context to the genes that are being interpreted, cell types to give more biological context. Uh, we think that each of these has the ability to significantly improve both the, pred the predictive accuracy of the models as well as be able to tell more interesting things. We want to test continuous endpoints, so not just does it cause this assay to be active or not, but also like what is the concentration at which it's active. So inhibitory concentration 50 would be an example of a continuous endpoint. We wouldn't really need to change much, we just need to change the values that are being fed into the predictive task. We also want to evaluate more complex network architectures. We want to try this on link prediction models as well as just as just node classification models, which is what we're currently doing. We want to see if we can use like regularization to better utilize information from the non-assay nodes. So that gets back to exactly what I was saying a minute ago. Um, we want to make sure that we're appropriately leveraging all of the information that's available to us. And it may require some tricky things with regularization to make sure we do that because we're working with highly heterogeneous networks right now. Uh, we also want to look at deep learning. You know, is it Will it give us better performance if we make really deep models? Who knows? It might, it might not. Um, we also want to develop more and better easy to use graphical tools like the things I showed earlier, you know, producing those network diagrams that will continue to lower the barrier for diverse user types. Um, this graph machine learning stuff I'm showing you, I'm sure that many of you could see what and could understand the things I was talking about, but particularly people without a strong computational background might have some barriers to using it, and we want to lower those barriers. Uh, and we also want to, as part of that, use some of the ontology framework that underlies all of this to further improve explainability. So can we generate human meaningful uh, interpretations and explanations that are automatically returned to the user uh, by in introspecting and interpreting the output values that are coming from these deep neural networks? And we think we can, that's a, another area of interest. Um, like I said, we have this explainability is partially built in as far as the ontological underpinnings, but it will require some real software work and developing tools that will make it so this actually can be realized. Um, standards and interoperability are a big thing for our future, so we want to perform qualitative studies to determine the needs of toxicologists. Um, both of these things are part of AIM-4 of the, of the K99R00 award that I'm in, so these are coming later in the process. Uh, we want to leverage the NIEHS P30 centers for environmental health sciences, um, the network of those different organizations to construct a network of toxicologists who can tell us what do we need CompTOX AI to do that will help you in an everyday context. Uh, and we also want to continue to build interoperable web services to connect CompTOX AI with other biomedical data resources like the Biomedical Data Translator, um, various EHR or clinical data tools using Smart on Fire or the Fire API interface. These are all things that we want to explore in the future. And we're in the process of de designing how we're going to go about doing this. Um, these are some other future plans that are not necessarily related to CompTOX AI, but things that uh, for those of you who will not be at my chalk talk tomorrow morning, uh, these are kind of things that I, I, I intend to talk about then. Um, one would be migrating this knowledge graphs and ontologies and graph machine learning work to look at multimodal clinical data, um, a little bit more than the toxicological data, particularly for the purposes of integrating EHR and biobank data in the same analysis in a way that's very easy for researchers to approach. Um, and we also think that the graph machine learning component can augment the results of these studies by, perform by providing more statistical power using biological knowledge. Uh, we, want to we want to build a distributed infrastructure for toxicology knowledge sharing and dissemination. This is sort of an evolution of the CompTOX AI uh, project and the K99R00, but we want to make it so uh, computational toxicologists and basic toxicologists can access a, a a standardized national infrastructure for representing adverse outcome pathways and other types of clinical outcomes that come from toxicological exposures because we have very poor representation of these types of entities and concepts in things like clinical data models and clinical data sharing networks and um, other types of resource sharing networks out there. 
There's a couple of resources that are developed by various European groups, but we haven't seen much yet in the US in this space. Uh, and also I'm very interested in method development whenever it's appropriate, particularly, like I said, in developing the methods used in heterogeneous graph machine learning and modern use of ontologies. So all of these things are things that are on my radar for the next two, five, 10 years and beyond. Um, and I'd love to you know, explore opportunities to continue to talk about these with, with folks who are on this call. So yeah, um, with that, I will wrap up. It's We're getting close to the end of the hour here. Um, I especially wanna thank my, um, my collaborators and my mentors, and of course, my grant funding, including um, not the least of which is the K99, but also the other um, center grants and R01s that have supported me over the years. Um, if you're interested in following me, my Twitter name is on there um, and you can contact me via email, but I think we have the ability to um, answer a couple questions now if anything else has cropped up since then. So thank you very much. Excellent. So normal, you know, post Zoom stunned silence is what this <laughs> is. So everybody, you know, there's a, a reaction where we can do a little clap sign so we can give Joseph a virtual round of applause, oh. even if he can't hear us. Thank you. I'm a big <laughs> fan of that. Um, does anybody have questions? I've got my usual um, beginner's questions here, but has anybody got uh, questions for Joseph on his, uh, on his talk? You, you may see my mouse moving around on the screen. That was just so I could open up the chat window. If anyone's afraid to speak, feel free to do that. Yes, do not be afraid to speak up. <laughs> I have another question. Uh, um, you're, regarding your um, ontological framework, uh, you, you have a huge number of chemicals in there. Uh, I mean, and your ontological framework seems pretty basic. Uh, are, are those like hundreds of thousands of chemicals? Uh, they're, they're, are they all just direct instances of that one chemical class? Yes, they are. So we're using an OWL2 standard for the ontology, which I think you, you must have picked up on by the fact that I have protege open here on the screen. Um, but, but yeah, so the way it works is all of the entities, uh, whatever class they are in, in the, in the graph database, that is, they are an instance of that ontology class. So that's, that's the way we designed it. They're not, they're not representing their own classes. And that made it a little bit more extensible. Um, and so by instantiating those classes, we're actually using the classes sort of as a, as a template to help make sure that we stay within the confines of the ontology which helps us to also ensure a little bit more about the about the ontology's data quality itself. Uh, I'm uh, I, I ask because uh, I'm wondering if you've considered, and I, I encourage you to consider uh, using uh, uh, much more uh, complex uh, publicly available ontologies. So, for example, uh, for chemicals, there's Kebi, yep. or the Kebi ontology, which has, you know, a very rich hierarchical structure of all kinds of chemical classes. Uh, now, Kebi is is much smaller in terms of no numbers of classes than your than your set of chemicals. It's not as comprehensive. But um, I'm wondering. I think it'd be really use interesting, and I think it'd be probably useful to. Um, take advantage of that rich hierarchical structuring of all the different chemical classes and uh, use that as features uh, in your learning. Uh, and I, I think yeah. that could be really productive. And, and by the way, you could do the same thing for your other classes too, like if you get those diseases and-, and, and Yeah, and, and, and you know, like gene ontology terms yep. and, and disease ontology. So we-, we yeah, absolutely. That, that's a that's great suggestion. And it's something that we, that we are thinking about. And um, part of the way that we are making sure that this is something we can do in the future is uh, we're using, so we have metadata attached to a lot of the entities in this um, that includes references to other types of resources and the source databases that it comes from. And we're putting um, identifiers for other ontologies in here. So the idea is that we should be able to directly translate the chemicals or the diseases or what have you down, down the line directly into what that other ontology is. So that way, if they go and change their ontology to be better, we don't necessarily need to be um, trying to look at every single update that they've made and constantly be updating the structure into ours. But instead of saying that we have this monolithic ontology structure, we want to make ours interoperable with there so it can simultaneously leverage both at the same time. Um, there's definitely a big ontological commitment component to this. So yeah, we could do that. Um, and we could end up with 
a structure that has, you know, thousands and thousands more classes related to chemicals than it does to diseases. Um, we, we chose not to do that, but, but yeah, I, I completely agree with you and we're working on ways to make it so this continues to be interoperable with these other external resources as well. Right, and not just interoperable. I, I was uh, uh, suggesting that I think the uh, that, that rich hierarchy mm -hmm. could be very useful as yeah. feature, feature attributes yes, for your yes. for your learning. Yep, and and that's something that we're we're continuing to add things to. So so yeah, we we'd love to have the ability to do that. Um, one of the reasons why I'm looking for a faculty position is so I can hire people. Uh, who can help me do this. Um, this is currently a, a one-man show at this point. <laughs> um, but, but, but yes, yeah, I, would, I, I think that that sounds great. So to be able to incorporate that as well as other features and characteristics sounds awesome. And, and I completely agree with you. All right, that's fantastic. It's a wonderful discussion. It's only three minutes left. So I think yeah. we can call it there unless there are any other questions. Thank you again, Dr. Romano, for coming to visit and talk with us. I do encourage everybody, please, if you can, um, bring your coffee and your breakfast to our 8 a.m. meeting. Uh, and we can we can learn more about Dr. Romano's current and future research plans. So thank you very much. Uh, wonderful afternoon exercise with everybody. Take care. Thank you all. And please feel free to contact me via email if anyone would like.